close your eyes and envision a place without water. Now envision a place that's abundant with water. What are the kinds of comparisons that you're making in your mind? And it's, it's really the thing that supports life. It feels good when it's a hot day. It feels good when you drink it. It feels good when you're swimming in Flathead Lake. As to your uh, spirituality, just to know that we have water, and if we're a culture without water, then we're missing something. Water is life to the native people. It's a living thing, and we want to make sure it stays healthy so we can, be, we can stay healthy ourselves. The Environmental Protection Agency was created in 1970, and soon after that, Congress got very busy developing anti-pollution laws. The Clean Water Act initially was an anti-pollution law. There were pollutants being dumped into waters, and Congress set it up that not only should the federal government have some interest in what was being put into these rivers, but it should also regulate and enforce against polluters that weren't meeting basic protections for waters. The Clean Water Act, developed by Congress in 1972, was silent about tribal governments and how they would fit into the Clean Water Act legislation. The Clean Water Act sets forth plain language goals for all U.S. waters to be fishable and swimmable. Failing to address waters in Indian country essentially created millions of acres of black hole where states did not have authority. In 1987, Congress amended the act to allow for treatment as a state, or TAS for short. TAS allows the EPA to delegate responsibility to tribes for managing water quality on reservations, similar to the authority delegated to states. In essence, the tribes are acting as an agent of the federal government. That means they have our back. If we have to go to the mat with someone over water quality standards, the federal government, number one, is our trustee. They're supposed to be there for us anyway, but they've also have put their name on our application and said, we are good with this. The Clean Water Act provides the legal and funding support for managing water quality across the United States, including reservations. We will look at four key sections of the act, which support the study and management of water quality. Section 303 deals with listing impaired water bodies and water quality standards. Section 402 deals with controlling point sources of pollution. Section 319 deals with non-point source pollution. And Section 106 deals with water monitoring. did receive treatment as a state. Uh, we did get a draft ordinance in place, and we started developing our standards based on what the state had already done as far as standards uh, for the state. Their standards didn't really apply on the reservation, but they had developed some. So we took those, applied them reservation-wide based on their science, and since then we've done a lot of refinement to that. What the standards do is, the, is they're composed of, of several things. Uh, there's narrative criteria. It's words that describe the appearance of water. It can't have an oily sheen. It can't smell bad. Some narrative description of how the, how the, the water is envisioned to be. And then it also would have numeric criteria. The temperature can't change only this many degrees in this amount of time. Or pH has to be between this range and that range. So both narrative and numeric criteria, and also a component called an anti-degradation policy. And this anti-degradation policy says that if your existing water is this clean, but the uses that you've designated for that water only require that it be this clean, you can't allow it to degrade down to just support existing uses. Diffuse or non-point sources of pollution are spread out over the landscape and include things like runoff from roads, timber harvesting activities, grazing, bank erosion, and application of fertilizer and pesticides. 
These types of pollutions are not regulated the same way point sources are and must be dealt with on a voluntary basis. The 319 grant program is also a program that requires the treatment similar to the state, so tribes do need to apply. Most of the water quality problems that we have to deal with we have to deal with on a voluntary basis. We have to seek landowner cooperation. So we work with landowners throughout the reservation on different projects and found them to be very successful to help these farmers and ranchers maybe put their cows in one location, get them some water, and start fencing off the riparian areas to allow them to grow back in its natural habitat. Today we are working with Jennifer Winterstein on uh, doing habitat assessments. We wrote a grant and uh, this grant is going to help us buy uh, equipment to uh, fence off the river here and uh, put in wells so the horses don't have to come down to the river and drink because what we're trying to do is we're trying to cut down on the uh, E. coli counts. Also we're trying to cut down on nutrients from the manure. Well, today we're doing a habitat assessment and uh, we're looking at refugia for fish and uh, bank conditions. The non-point source program is great in that there's money to help do some kind of protection or some kind of restoration and money to help monitor that implementation activity. What we're going to do is we're going to fence this area off, take out all the corrals, fence it off to where the horses can't come to the river, and we're going to reseed the area. Put a, a buffer zone here so when it rains we don't get runoff from the, the manure into the river. Before and after the implementation activity has taken place, there's monitoring that needs to occur to support the reasons for the restoration and then to see if that was successful and if it's being protected adequately or it's restored to a level where the Clean Water Act goals can be fulfilled, of fishable and swimmable goals here. Water is considered the sacred lifeblood of many native cultures a concept that is passed down through oral tradition and stories. There's a story of two boys that uh, were taken from their mother's womb. This is an old crow story. Um, their mother was killed while she was pregnant with them. An evil woman killed her and she took the two children out of the womb while they were still babies and she tried to get rid of them. She threw one over there in the water and she threw other one, the other one behind the teepee lining and she left and uh, the father came back uh, from an off all day hunting and when he came back to his home he found that his wife had been killed and that one of uh, the babies was uh, thrown behind the liner, the teepee. And so uh, he discovered that baby and uh, he was so thankful that he had uh, this baby still, he raised it up. It took many years before the father discovered that his boy was uh, actually an animal living in the water. But when he found out, he devised a plan and with his other son, they captured him, they tied him up and they brought him into the sweat lodge and they poured water on the rocks, the same water that that boy had grown up in and turned him into a water animal. They poured that same water on the rocks and with the prayers and the steam, they were able to heal this animal and turn him back into a human being again. This water that all of us have inside of our blood, you know, it's come from the heavens, it's gone down these rivers from the mountains all the way to the ocean, back up around again, and it's through us again. You know, the same water that's in us was in our great-great-grandfathers, great-great-great-grandmothers. And so this is part of the reason why we're human beings. And uh, this is part of our charge as Indian people is to recognize the simple, profound fact that we are nothing more than water and that we need to protect ourselves and we need to protect our water sources.